All right, here we go again. Back to basic Bible study. I am your host, um, your facilitator, your teacher for this hour, Reverend Corey Evans Sr. This is Back to Basics Bible Study. This is our weekly Zoom line, um, virtual Bible study that God placed upon our heart, um, beginning at the uh, starting at the beginning of the pandemic to come virtual and do a Bible study, but to get back to basics, to study the Bible book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line, verse by verse, word by word if necessary, so that the people of God may understand the content and the context of God's word. If this is something that interests you, if you're viewing by YouTube, I would uh, ask, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, like, share it, give a, give a constructive comment, uh, and hit that notifications bell so that you will be notified every week when we post videos. It doesn't cost you a dime, split second to do it, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Uh, and tell somebody about the channel, tell someone about the YouTube uh, channel, tell someone about the Zoom line, okay? So we have now worked ourselves down to um, 1 Samuel, the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17, and we will start there, okay? And you see, for those of you guys that have the notes on your screen, um, you will see that we're in the third division of the chapter, um, the first division was Samuel, judge and prophet in Israel. The second division was Saul, the first king of, of Israel. Now the third section or division of the chapter is the decline of Saul and the rise of David. Okay, that started chapter 13. So we're all the way over in chapter 17. So let's, let's keep moving. Okay. Keep your Bibles, those of you guys that are new to this channel or new to the Bible study, keep your Bibles in front of you because we walk directly down the chapter. Word for word, we walk straight down the chapter. You can highlight or make notes as you, as you see fit. You can screenshot anything that you see on the screen. Everything is free. Everything is available. There's no, there is no cost and will never be a cost for anything on the channel. Okay, so... Um, let's look at chapter 17. This is a familiar story. This will be easy to understand. This is a familiar story, David and Goliath. Okay. We have been taught this since a child, this story. Okay. So it's kind of hard pressed to try to pull out something that you may not have known, but let's, let's deal with chapter 17. Um, and as you see, there are things that in my notes, there are things that are highlighted and things that are not that's just to bring out emphasis and certain things. So, so let's, let's, let's flow through this chapter. I know it's pretty easy, pretty familiar. Okay. Chapter 17 starts out in your study Bible. As I say, always study Bible. If you don't have one, get one. Okay. Um, now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle. Okay, and we're gathered at Sokar, which belongs to Judah. That's what we need to know there. The Philistines gathered their armies, and keep in mind here, and always make notes because there's a lot of things I'm going to say that really is not listed on the page that I have discovered in research. Okay. When it says they gathered together their armies to battle, they have been building themselves. Um, they have been building themselves, building their strength up again, okay, from when they were, from when they were defeated before, okay, or lost um, military strength before. So this has been an ongoing process. So this has been building up is what you need to know, okay? They have been building up to this point and building their strength, and they have um, formed now a new leader or a new champion, and we'll go over that. Okay, verse two, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Eli and drew, drew up in battle array against the Philistines. So it's that's exactly what it means. You have one army on one side in, in battle array and military formation, and then the other on the other side. Verse three, now the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. Mm. So you can picture to themselves, neither one really wanted to go to battle right now. <laughs> they were on the, on a mountain on one side. Nobody was in the valley and because here's what was happening. 
And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. Okay. Uh, it says he was from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. This was a huge giant. Okay. So the reason for them being on the mountains and the valley in between, because they were about to set up this one-on-one -on -one battle. You know, it's funny. We see, we've seen that. I remember that in my childhood and we see that to this day when someone is about to fight and there's a bunch of people around, they say, oh no, one-on-one, -on -one. nobody jump in one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> we, you remember that as a child, right? So what it is, this is what they're doing. They're saying, instead of the armies fighting, we're going to send out who we know is our best warrior, this giant Goliath, okay? And this is planned. They have been planning this all along. Necessarily so, Israel did not know that this was being planned all along, okay? But um, the Philistines have been growing in power, in strength, uh, with their army, and now they're putting forth this trained military champion who they feel cannot be defeated, okay? Verse five, he had a bronze helmet. It just talks about what he had um, on him. <clears throat> bronze helmet. Uh, he was armed with a coat, a protective coat of mail. A weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. So a bronze coat. This is just armor, okay? Just take it. This is just armor. And he had bronze armor on his legs and bronze javelin between his shoulders. Okay, so he was protected front and back. Okay, head to toe. What you need to note is he was protected head to toe. Okay, verse seven. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam uh, and his iron uh, spearhead weighted 600 shekels and a shield bearer went with him. Okay, what you can put in your notes, I think I forgot to put it in there. Um, what you can put in your notes, you see where it says, and a shield bearer went with him. It was customary in that time that a armor bearer or shield bearer went with you. And what that was, as he was, because you could not attack and protect at the same time. Okay. So as he was attacking the shield bearer would hold this huge shield behind him to make sure that his that he had his back. Okay? So keep that in mind. So that's what it means by in a shield bearer went before him. Okay? So uh, the shield bearer accompanied him as he was fighting or attacking. He would put up the shield to watch his back. Okay? And would hold the shield because you couldn't hold this huge shield and and sway this um, sword or staff, okay? So that was another reason, okay? Moving right along, moving right along. Verse eight, then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, y'all come on in, uh, why have you come out to line up for battle? It says, am I not a Philistine? Mm. So what is he saying? Why do you even choose to come out here? I'm a Philistine. You're nothing. That's what it says. I Am I not a Philistine? And you, the servants of Saul? Now, did they say, did he say servants of the Most High God? No. He said servants of Saul. Keep that in mind. Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. Mm. So... Keep in mind, they have been planning this all along and preparing their champion. Israel didn't necessarily have a champion prepared, okay? So verse nine, if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. That's the key. They have this planned all along, people, okay? This has been planned. So, and the Philistine says, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Mm, he's mocking them. Then, semicolon, he says, give me a man that we may fight together. So the fate of Israel and the Philistines is now on two men. But the other man hasn't been shown yet. So, Verse 11, 
when Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and get this underlined, greatly afraid. Now, why would they be afraid? Why should they be afraid? If the most high God Yahweh has fought your battles, battle after battle, war after war, deliverance after deliverance, why are you dismayed and afraid? Okay, side note, what does that have to do with you? If God has brought you from then until now, why are you dismayed? Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? We have to pull out our life lessons from scripture. Don't just read scripture and people say, oh, that's just stories. No, it's examples of what happened and how you can apply it to your life. If God delivered you from one thing or from one battle, then why when new things come up, we get dismayed and afraid? He did it before, he can do it again. Put that in your notes. He did it before, he can do it again in your life, okay? Let's keep moving, okay, 12. Now, David was the son of that Ephraimite of Bethlehem, Judah, okay? So we see his lineage, David of Judah. We know that, why? Thy lion of Judah, thy king of David, okay? Uh, keep in mind, Judah was the tribe of the line that David came from and that, that the Messiah comes from. So Judah was very important. The tribe of Judah was very important. Keep that in mind, okay? Uh, whose name was Jesse. So Jesse's son, David, okay? The father was Jesse. Let me make sure to say that. Uh, and Jesse had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. And the three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to battle. Now it gives the names of them. We don't have to go over that. Um, skip to 14. David was the youngest, okay? And the three oldest followed Saul. Verse 15, but David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. He was the youngest. So he was going back and forth, feeding the sheep. He would go check on his brothers. He would feed the sheep. He would go back and forth. 16, and the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. Now, what's the significance of that? Even though we see 40 days and 40 nights throughout the Bible, right? That's significant. But what I'm saying is in 40 days, no one had 40 days, no one had the sense or the courage to step up and fight against Goliath. 40 days, 40 nights. Okay? You see that? Now, that's significant because we know the other things that happen 40 days and 40 nights. And if those things happen, they should have the courage to fight against Goliath because it wasn't them fighting. It would have been God fighting for them, the Most High Yahweh, right? So, Put that in your notes, okay? So then, um, verse 17, then Jesse said to his son, David, take now for your brothers an ephah of this dry grain and these 10 loaves and run to your brothers at the camp, right? So he's going, his brothers was there. They weren't doing anything, but the soldiers were to be provided for. So he was going to take his brother's food, okay? And verse 18, and carry these 10 cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back um, news of them. This is just a father um, sending his son, youngest son, to aid the troops and the brothers and to bring back a report, okay? Verse 19, so Saul and they had all the men of Israel were in the valley of Eli fighting with the Philistines. 20, so David arose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going to fight to the fight and shouting for battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, a army against army. Now, had they did anything yet? No. <laughs> and did anything yet. Okay. <clears throat> it said they drawn up in battle array. Okay. So then, 22, and David less left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. 
So what was this? Just a means of getting David there, the most courageous and confident person there. This was God's way of getting him there. Okay. 23. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine, the Gath, Goliath, by name coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them according to the same words just means he spoke the same way he had been speaking every day for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay. Same way. That's all that means. 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, get this, what did they do? Fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. That's even worse. So now what that means is you can put in your notes. That means that their fear had grown exponentially every day. Okay. Those 40 days. See, that's why we break down scripture word for word. It gave you the specification of 40 days. It said he was making this proclamation um, daily. So now their fear has grown. And now it specifies that they were dreadfully afraid. See? Okay. Verse 25. So the men of Israel says, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich, get this now, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter. Don't forget this. I want you to remember this. He will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Okay. Remember this. This is going to come into play in the next chapter. Okay. And it shall be that the man who kills him, Goliath, the king will enrich with great riches, one, will give him his daughter, two, so he will have a connection to the, the, to the, to the uh, kingship, to the royal court, should I say, he will have a connection to that, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. That's very important. 26, then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? David is speaking, oh, he is speaking, that he should defy the armies of the living God. There it is. Do you see the difference between when David speaks and everyone else speaks? David is saying, who should defy the armies of Yahweh, the most high God? Who should come against Israel, the great nation of Israel, the royal priesthood, the peculiar people, the people separated unto God? Who shall come against us? But then he added a special note in there. He says, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine? It doesn't matter. Philistine or whoever from ever under the nation, uncircumcised is the key. Why are you saying that, Rev? He's not connected to the covenant. Put that in your notes, people. Did you miss that? Uncircumcised Philistines. We are covenant people with the most high God. We have been circumcised. You remember the circumcision? All the people, all the men had to be circumcised. Why? As a sign of the covenant. Why? the Which covenant, Rev? The Abrahamic covenant. They, everyone else is not connected to the covenant, people. We are here understanding why scripture is written, okay? We're giving reasons why it is written. We might not get past two chapters today. Um, uncircumcised. They are not involved or connected to the covenant and i hope you caught that in your reading if not that's why we have bible study amen somebody so they are not connected this is why we still when babies are born now they are circumcised that's where the tradition comes from okay so david is saying you're not circumcised you are philistine how dare you come against the circumcised the covenant people of Israel, God's chosen people, Yahweh, the most high God. 
Okay, 27. And the people answered, let me calm down. And the people answered him in this manner saying, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. Okay, so shall it be done. Now, Eliab, I believe it's Eliab, um, or Eliab, Eliab, his oldest brother heard, and when he spoke to the man, um, heard when he spoke to the men, uh, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. This is where someone would say his brother is a hater, okay, um, was aroused against David, and he said, why did you come down here? Okay, David was sent down there. David was sent there by his father. And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your, get this, I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. I know what's in your heart. You're prideful right now. My brother, my sister, side note, side note, all the way over here on the side. When God tells you to do something miraculous, when God tells you to do something that's within his will, the devil will always bring up somebody in your path to try to get you sidetracked. Now, I hate to tell you this, but it's somebody in your inner circle, somebody close to you. You don't care about the people outside your circle, but it's always someone, a family member, a friend, uh, a coworker, uh, a carpooler, somebody that you come in contact with on a consistent basis will be the one that the devil use. It's not their fault. They don't recognize how the devil attacks and how they use. Okay. All right. So he was like, no, nah, I didn't, I don't remember all this stuff from, from when I was taught this as a child. I know, but you're an adult now. So we have to bring out good things. Okay. All right. Let's move along. His brother is telling him, I know your heart. You're prideful. Uh, why did you even come down here? And you left your responsibility of the sheep. But remember, David is in order because he left the sheep with a keeper and his father told him to come down. Now, verse 29. And when David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Mm. David said, for one, what have I done wrong? And for two, is it not cause for me to be here? Now, verse 31, skip to 31. Now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul and he sent for him. 32, then David said to Saul, let David, and speaking to the king, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Hmm. And David said, so Saul said to David, I'm sorry, Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You are a youth. You are a little boy. And he is a man of war from his youth. He has been trained all these years for this very moment. David had not. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord, mm, Yahweh, the most high God who delivered me from the paw of a lion and from the paw of a bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Now I put a note in there. He was what? Giving honor and credit to God, to Yahweh, the most high God. So he was saying, I'm not fearful of anyone before me because it's not me fighting. It's my God that fights for me. Any battle that you come across in your life, if you give it to God, if you pray about it, fast on it, meditate on it, let God order your steps and direct your path, he will fight for you. Stop trying to fight in and of yourself. He will fight for you, but give him the praise, the glory, and the honor before it ever happens and, and accept and pray and praise God 
on the victory before you ever get it, okay? David is saying, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he, capital H, divine God, will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Get it? He's praising God before the battle is over, before the battle even starts, before the victory is won, he's already praising God. That's your example right there. And another note, Everything that has happened in your past has caused you to gain strength, battle over battle, situation over situation. And now that strength, when this large war or battle comes, you should lean and depend on your past experiences. Okay, you get it? He says, I've dealt with a lion, I've dealt with a bear. Now I'm going to deal with this uncircumcised Philistine. Everything in your life, every battle that God has brought you through, every test, every trial strengthens you for the next one. So I'm always being attacked. You're just being grown. You're being <laughs> groomed for the next battle. When the battle comes in your life, I'm being groomed for the next one. You're getting stronger and stronger and stronger for the next battle. But let the Lord fight your battles, okay? And Saul said to David in 37, go, and the Lord will be with you. I put a note in there for you. David's confidence impressed the king, so he trusted the whole entire fate of Israel to a little boy because no one else was speaking in confidence. David was the only one speaking in confidence. When you love the Most High God, speak in confidence. Don't be walking around here speaking like a wimp. Okay, speak in confidence. 38, so Saul clothed David. Saul clothed David with his armor and put a bronze helmet on his head and also clothed him with the cloak of man. So he gave him his armor, which you can imagine the king had the best armor you could possibly have. So he gave David the best armor, okay? Some of it couldn't fit him. Now that's a side note, but David was a boy. He was... Um, remember Saul was the tallest of men around, you know, whatever. So some of, some of it was oversized. Okay. 39, David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them. You always test your armor and your weapons before you go to battle. Okay. And Saul said to him, I cannot walk with these. I mean, David, David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I've not tested them. So David took them off. Get it? The best armor in the land, David took them off. He had not fought with them before, and they were oversized for him, right? So verse 40, then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself, here we go, we all know this story, five smooth stones. And I've heard preachers say they weren't rugged stones, they were smooth stones, okay? We ain't, we're not preaching today, but five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, um, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. My brother, my sister, what is it saying? You don't need anything extra to go to war when God sends you to war. You don't need anything extra for your battle because God has delivered you already. God has fought for you already. David was a shepherd. When animals would come against his sheep, he had his pouch, he had stones, he had his slingshot. He would ward off any animal with what he had in the field with his sheep. He didn't need anything else. That's what God equipped him with and sent him there with. That's what he was going to fight with because he already proclaimed, okay, that what? The Most High God will fight for me, all right? So, and people talk about those smooth stones. It said they was from the brook, the water, stones in water, people, moving water will be smooth, okay? They will be smooth. They All years after years when the stone is formed is in the water and the water makes them smooth. I've heard preachers do all this talking about why they were smooth. It's just, it says they were in the brook. I'm sorry, is it, this is what scripture says. It says it was in the brook. That's why they were smooth. Okay, <laughs> so now let's move right along before I make some preachers mad, okay? And when the Philistines looked about and saw David, he 
disdained him for he was only of you ruddy but he was good looking i like how they say but good looking okay so this giant was saying how dare you come before me how dare you come before me this little ruddy youth make this note i might not even finish this chapter make this note this is an example people of what god always did Remember how he would cut down hundreds of thousands down to 10,000s just to fight a battle? So that what? So that the people would not say that they won the battle, but that God fought for them. This is the same thing, okay? A small in statue man is about to fight this huge giant. It's the same principle as small group of soldiers go and fight large armies and are successful because they are not fighting. God is fighting for them. I, I, I hope you guys are making all these notes. Okay. Verse 43, the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you have come to me with sticks? And the Philistines cursed David by his gods, little G, by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beast of the field. Oh my God, did you hear that? Mm. And David said to the Philistines, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the most high God. I came to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have cursed and defied and spoke against. Mm, do you hear that? Is that confidence? 46, this day the Lord will, will, will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head clean off your body. Okay, don't say that. It said, take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air. Oh my God, look at what he's speaking. And the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. So I'm about to take, I'm about to decapitate you, Goliath. And then the Philistines, since you say I, my flesh will be served to the birds and the beasts, I'm going to make sure that the Philistines' flesh be served to the bird and the wild beast. Mm. so that everyone around will know what that there is a god in israel his name is yahweh okay 47 then all this assembly shall know that the lord does not save with sword and spear now what is our one of our favorite scriptures for the battle is the lord's and he will give you into our hands the battle is not mine but it is the Lord's, okay? Underline that, 48. So it was when the Philistines arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David, did he slowly went in? No. Did he timidly act it? It says that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistines. Oh my God, look at that confidence. Look at that confidence, people. When the Philistines arose and came and drew near to meet David, he hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistines. God has his back, okay? Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. Uh, side note, that was the opening for his eyes. That was the only exposed part of his body. He was covered in armor from head to toe. The only opening was his eyes. So David aimed at the one opening that he had. He hit it the first time and um, struck him in the face. Struck him not only in the face, but the forehead. It, it pierced his brain and killed him. Okay. Now, side note here. I'm giving y'all a lot of notes. I hope y'all are making notes while I'm saying this. I'm speaking as the spirit is giving it to me. Y'all y'all, y'all, y'all have to deal with that, okay? Yes, he had five stones just in case he missed. But how many did he use? One. 
He had five stones just in case he missed, but how many did he use? He used one. When God is fighting your battle, your offense, your offense is perfect, okay? 50, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a, and a stone, not five stones, were one stone, a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Why? He didn't need it. 51, therefore, and remember, Saul gave him a sword, but it was too big. He was a little boy. 51, therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of his seat and killed him and cut off his head with it. You said, well, he was already dead. He, yes, but he made sure he was dead, dead. Okay. <laughs> so he cut off his head. Now, this was not proof of victory, but as a trophy for the king, the act of cutting off the head. Okay. Remember that. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they ran, they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. Now, what happened to all these scared people, okay? What happened to all these fearful people, dreadfully fearful people? Now, all of a sudden, they got confidence. They arose and shouted and pursued. Mm. Ain't that something? All, they, all that the Most High God has done for Israel, every time he's delivered them, they're so scared they had to wait for a little boy to fight for them. Remember I told you the cycle of sin and disobedience? Okay, look back on those notes. 53, this is a long chapter, guys, I know. 53, then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their tents, okay? And David took the head of the Philistines and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent, okay? 55, when Saul saw David going uh, against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? Well, you know he already know that, right? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. So the king says, inquire whose son this young man is. Um, then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, I, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite in Judah. Mm. So. Saul resents David, starting verse 18, you see the new subheading, um, it says, I'm sorry, chapter 18, that, that concludes chapter 17, uh, where it says, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite, okay, uh, now, we got through 17, guys, I know it was a long chapter, so now it's 18, uh, chapter 18, put in your notes, chapter 18, uh, it says, Saul resents David. Okay. So let's see how this works. Let's see how this flows. Verse one, chapter 18. Now, when he had finished speaking to Saul, the son of Jonathan, uh, the soul, I'm sorry, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. Now, side note, Jonathan was the son of Saul. Okay. Jonathan was the son of Saul. So he was the prince. Keep that in mind. Saul was the king. So Jonathan was the prince. Okay. Now let's see if we can get through 18. The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David and Jonathan loved David as his own soul. They were around the same age. Most theologians say, so that was friend and friend, buddy and buddy. Okay. They connected because of their youth. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Remember when Samuel warned the people that Saul would take their sons and their daughters for himself. Remember, so verse two in chapter 18 says, Saul took him that day and would not let him go to his father's house anymore. Okay, then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him in his soul. Um, that means that they were sworn brothers for life. That's what that means. 
Verse four, and Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David. This was a sign of royalty, you know, with his armor, even to his sword and his uh, bow and his belt. So David went out. Now that fit him. Okay. The king's armor did not fit him. Okay. Just, just a little side note. I just like to give you all little tidbits of knowledge. Okay. Um, so David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely though, wisely, uh, understanding that Saul was the king. Okay. Even though David had been chosen, he had not taken office yet. Okay. So Saul sent him over the men of war and sent him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servant. Okay. Now it happened uh, that they were coming home. And when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine, verse six, that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, verse seven, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. Mm. Then Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him. And he says, they have ascribed to David 10,000 and to me, they have scribed only thousands. Now, what more can he have but my kingdom, but the kingdom? Okay. For just for your knowledge, you see this today. If our armies go to war, you see parades back home when they come back, okay? You see people lined up at the airports to this day, greeting our soldiers when they come back. You see your favorite sports team, football team, baseball team, soccer team, when they win the championship war and come or battle, sports battle, when they come back, there's a parade get it so the what the women did was common knowledge it was the custom but they made the mistake of praising the warrior and not the king get it okay verse nine so saw so i david from that day forward eyed him mean what some of y'all would say side eye or looked him up and down or frowned at him. Or that means that from that moment forward, he looked at him in a negative fashion. Um, verse 10. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul. Remember, we talked about that already. The distressing spirit that God placed upon Saul that came and went after he took the anointing from Saul and gave it to David, okay? So, uh, meaning he took the kingship from him, but just not in person yet, okay? So, uh, now, here's, this is important. The distressing spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied inside the house. So, David played music with his hand, as at other times, remember, the harp that David played would calm the distressing spirit of Saul, the king, okay? But there was a spear in Saul's hand, okay? All right, but let me read verse 11 before I read the note. And Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall, but David escaped his presence twice, okay? Now, I put a note in there for you after verse 10, prophesied in this context, you have to look it up, means under a good or bad spirit. It was not him prophesying <laughs> um, in a good way or over the people, okay? Not him proclaiming prophecy. It was he prophesied meaning means under a good or bad spirit, meaning under a spirit. And here in this context, it means that he was in a frenzy like he was going crazy. And so it said distressing spirit. So in this context, when I researched it, it means that he was acting out in a frenzy. And David was trying to calm him with the music, 
But before the music could calm him, he threw a spear at David's head to kill him. Okay, got it? Verse 12, now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him. The Lord was fighting for David, but had departed from Saul. Okay, remember? Okay, Thir 13, therefore Saul removed from from his presence, removed him from his presence and made him as captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. That may be kind of confusing for you. Why would he do that if he hated him? But we're going to find out. Verse 14, and David behaved wisely in all his ways and the Lord was with him. 15, therefore, when Saul saw that he behaved wisely, he was afraid of him. But all of Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. Now, here's your note. Saul gave him a military commission because you're wondering why would he bless him like that if he hated him and wanted to kill him. But Saul gave him a military commission, which was intended to be an exile, but an honorable exile because the people loved him. So he was sending him away, getting rid of him out of his face, but he was actually exiling him, okay? But this post of duty served only to give him a stronger hold of the people's affections, okay? The people just loved him more and more because he won battle after battle, okay? Now, let's get through this. It says, David marries Michael, Michael. Okay, Michael, I believe it's pronounced. Forgive me for any mispronunciations, okay? Um, let's look at this. Then Saul said to David, here's my older daughter, um, Merab, Merab, M-E-R-A-B. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, let my hand not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. Simply saying, I know that the Lord fights for you. Be valiant for me as your king, but fight for God. Fight for me, but God is fighting with you. But he's saying, I'm not going to kill him. The Philistines will kill him in battle. Okay, verse 18. So David said to Saul, who am I, who am I, and what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be the son-in-law to the king? This is in response to him saying, I will give you my daughter as a wife, 19. But it happened at the same time when Morab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David that she was given to um, Adriel as a wife. Adriel as, a, Adriel, as a wife. Why would that happen? Okay, get this. Saul had already promised his daughter. Remember, I went over it several times to make you remember that they said whoever killed Goliath would what? Have riches, have my daughter and his family, his father's family would never have to pay taxes to the king, right? That was a promise. David fulfilled that. He killed Goliath, right? So now Saul is acting like he totally forgot, which he didn't, the command that he put out. And he's now restating like he never said it before. I will give you my daughter. Okay. Now, why is he doing this? See, Saul had already promised his daughter to the one who killed Goliath, but he did it so that I'm proclaiming, I will give you my daughter. But then he withdrew the offer and gave his daughter to someone else to mock and to embarrass David, okay, inside of the people and to bring down, you know, David in front of the people, all right, to embarrass David. So verse 20, did you guys get that? Okay, so verse 20, now, um, Macau, I think it's Macau, then Macau, uh, Saul's daughter, she loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing blessed him. 
So Saul says, I will give her to him that she may be a snare to him. So he still had ulterior motives. She loved David, but he's saying, oh, if you love David, I'll give you to David and you shall be a snare to him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. For some reason, this may weaken David or she, he will use her to get at David. Therefore, Saul said to David a second time, you shall be my son-in-law today. And Saul commanded his servants, communicate with David secretly, secretly, and say, look, the king has delight in you and all his servants love you. Now, therefore, become the king's son-in-law. So Saul's servants spoke those words to the hearing of David. And David said, does it seem to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing I am poor and lightly esteemed man? Remaining humble. And the servant said, servants um, of Saul told him, saying um, exactly what David said, verse 25. And Saul said, Thus you shall say to David, the king does not desire any dowry, but 104 skins of Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistine. So since you don't have any money to give me, I don't require money, but I require that you kill 100 Philistines and not only kill them, but circumcise them and bring me the foreskins. Yeah, that's gross. Okay, I'm sorry. That's gross. So they were the uncircumcised nations, right? So he says, great man of Israel, go circumcise them. Not only kill them, but humiliate them by circumcising them, okay? So he knew before he would do a hundred of them, somebody would kill him, all right? So when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to become the king's son-in-law, okay? So therefore, David arose and went, uh, he and his men, and killed 200 men of the Philistines, okay? Now, what did it say? It said to kill 100. David killed 200. Did you see the difference? And David brought their foreskins and they gave them in full count, 200, to the king that he might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him his daughter as wife. 28, then Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michal, or Michael, um, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was still more afraid of David. No matter what I'm trying to do, <laughs> David is still around. So Saul became David's enemy continually, okay? Then the prince of the Philistines went out to war. And so it was whenever they went out that David behaved more wisely. He conducted himself correctly, honoring God, but honoring that he had a king. He never did anything outside the will of God, but outside the orders of the king. That's what that means that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul so that his name became highly esteemed. Amen. That concludes chapter 18. I know those chapters was long. I was hoping to get through more chapters, but I made a promise to everyone that I would slow down and that we would not rush through these chapters. Amen. Amen. So I thank God for each and every one of you. Uh, continue your reading at chapter 18, which starts, Saul persecutes David, okay? So we will continue the story of David, how he rose to power and became the second king of Israel, which was the first chosen king of Israel, but we have to say the second king of Israel, okay? Because Saul was first, but the people chose Saul, God chose David, amen? Amen. Guys, I love you. I love you. I love you. I thank God for you. Uh, I thank God for you coming on this line. Those of you guys, again, that are viewing by YouTube, if this content interests you, if you love God and you love God's word, then you will hit that subscribe button in front of you. Hit subscribe, like, share, like all of the videos so that we have a bunch of people viewing the channel, but only a few people subscribing. So subscribe when you do that and like the videos, YouTube will push out this information to other people and therefore you will do your part of fulfilling the Great Commission, amen? Amen, as we always say in closing, I love you 
And as our closing prayer, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May this word grow as seed in your spirit and manifest in your heart. And may your love of God grow through your knowledge of God's word. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Come back and see me next week for Back to Basics Bible Study. Pick up 1 Samuel. Uh, we did 17 and 18, start at verse 19, and we will get as far as we can. Amen? Amen. This concludes chapter, I mean, session 77. God bless you. See you next week.